Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel, and today we'll examine several illustrated examples of series DC circuit analysis. This lecture operates under the presumption that the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with series DC circuit properties, including Kirchhoff's voltage law, and can wield the DC voltage divider rule without cutting themselves. If you lack the requisite level of familiarity with these topics, please review the supporting material at the Big Bad Tech channel and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Mastery of series DC circuit analysis necessitates active participation on your part. I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems on your own. If your answers do not match those illustrated, by all means, feel free to rewind the lecture and correct any mistakes you may have made. Our first illustrated example features a 36 volt source in series with a 560 ohm resistor, a 910 ohm resistor, and a 300 ohm resistor. We're being asked to solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, the power dissipated by each element, the source current, and the total power. Additionally, we're being asked to solve for unknown voltage Vx with the indicated polarity. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. Present all answers in proper engineering format rounded to the tenths place. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Before we begin the analysis of this circuit, it's perhaps worth a moment of our time to review fundamental series circuit properties. First, current through elements in series is the same. This is the most fundamental series circuit property. For this circuit, Source current equals I1, which equals I2, which equals I3. If we solve for current through any series element, we by extension also solve for current through all remaining elements. Additionally, Kirchhoff's voltage law states that for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. A Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this series circuit, starting here and traveling in the clockwise direction, suggests that E equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. We'll examine unknown voltage Vx in a moment. Additionally, we should expect the largest resistor in this series circuit to drop the largest amount of voltage and dissipate the largest amount of power. Conversely, we should expect the smallest resistor in this series circuit to drop the smallest amount of voltage and dissipate the smallest amount of power. Finally, power in always equals power out. For this circuit, Pn equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Perhaps the easiest, most direct means of doing so is through the use of the DC voltage divider rule. The DC voltage divider rule set up to solve for V1 suggests that V1 equals R1 divided by R1 plus R2 plus R3 times our total supply voltage E. Substituting our given values yields V1 to be 11.4 volts. We could use another implementation of the DC voltage divider rule applied to the remaining elements. However, let's make use of Ohm's law. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Substituting our given values yields I1 to be 20.3 milliampers. Current through elements in series is the same. This is the most fundamental series DC circuit property. I source equals I1, which equals I2, which equals I3, and they all equal 20.3 milliampers. Another implementation of Ohm's law demonstrates that V2 is 18.5 volts. We could use another implementation of the DC voltage divider rule or Ohm's law to solve for V3. However, let's use Kirchhoff's voltage law to do so. We know source voltage and V1 and V2. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation solving for unknown voltage V3 suggests that V3 equals E minus V1 minus V2. Substituting our given values yields V3 to be the remaining 6.1 volts. As a means of checking our work, we can use Ohm's law to solve for I3. Substituting our value obtained using Kirchhoff's voltage law does indeed yield 20.3 milliampers as we'd expect. P1 equals V1 times I1. Substituting our given values demonstrates that P1 is 231.7 milliwatts. We can use another permutation of the power equation to solve for P2, where P2 equals V2 squared divided by R2. Substituting in our given values yields P2 to be 376.4 milliwatts. We can use a third permutation of the power equation to solve for P3, where P3 equals I3 squared times R3. Substituting in our given values demonstrates P3 is 124.1 milliwatts. Power in equals power out. P total equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. Substituting in our calculated values demonstrates that P total is 732.2 milliwatts. As a means of checking our work, supply voltage times source current also yields 732.2 milliwatts of total power. Let's now use Kirchhoff's voltage law to examine unknown voltage Vx. Another application of Kirchhoff's voltage law starting here and traveling in the clockwise direction demonstrates that E equals V1 plus Vx where an algebraic manipulation demonstrates that E minus V1 equals Vx. 
substituting in our given values demonstrates that Vx is 24.6 volts. Another application of Kirchhoff's voltage law, starting here and traveling in the counterclockwise direction, demonstrates that rise Vx is equal to the summation of voltage drops V2 and V3. Substituting in our given values similarly demonstrates that Vx is 24.6 volts. Given both analyses yielded 24.6 volts, I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct, and we can move on to the next illustrated example. Our next illustrated example problem features a 20 volt source in series with a 620 ohm resistor and a 1 kilo ohm potentiometer at three different settings. In the first circuit, it's set to 700 ohms. In the second circuit, it's set to a maximum 1 kilo ohm. And finally, in the third circuit, it's set to a minimum of 0 ohms. We're being asked to solve for the voltage drop across each element and the current through each element. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. For the first circuit, the 20 volt source sees a total resistance of 620 plus 700 ohms or 1320 ohms, or more appropriately, roughly 1.3 kilo ohms. Source current is equal to supply voltage divided by total resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrate source current to be 15.2 milliampers. Current through elements in series is the same. This is the most fundamental series circuit property. I source equals I1, which equals I2, and they all equal 15.2 milliampers. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 will be 9.4 volts. We could use another application of Ohm's law to solve for V2. However, we can also solve for V2 using algebraic manipulation of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. The Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this circuit suggests that E equals V1 plus V2. Substituting our given value for the source and our calculated value for V1, demonstrates that unknown voltage V2 is the remaining 10.6 volts. As a means of checking our work, an application of Ohm's law similarly demonstrates a V2 to be 10.6 volts. We can use identical techniques to solve for properties in the second circuit. With the potentiometer set to a maximum of 1 kilo ohm, the source sees a total resistance of 1,620 ohms. Source current is equal to supply voltage divided by total resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrates that source current has dropped to 12.3 milliampers. Current through elements in series is the same. This is the most fundamental series DC circuit property. Source current equals I1, which equals I2, and they all equal 12.3 milliampers. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 will be 7.7 .7 volts. An algebraic manipulation of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation demonstrates that V2 will be the remaining 12.3 volts. As a means of checking our work, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V2 is indeed 12.3 volts. We can use identical techniques to solve for these properties for the third implementation of the same circuit. With the potentiometer set to a minimum of 0 ohms, the 20 volt source sees only resistance of R1 for a total resistance of 620 ohms. Source current is equal to supply voltage divided by total resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrates that source current has increased to 32.3 milliampers. Current through elements in series is the same. Source current equals I1, which equals I2, and they all equal 32.3 milliampers. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 will experience all 20 volts. And an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that V2 will drop no voltage. As a means of checking our work, an application of Ohm's law confirms this suspicion. You'll note in this particular application, R1, the 620 ohm resistor, serves as a failsafe such that the source is always presented with an opposition of at least 620 ohms. Current at maximum can rise to 32.3 milliampers. If, however, the potentiometer is increased to a maximum of 1 kilo ohm, the source can at most produce 12.3 milliampers of current. Alright, let's move on to the next illustrated example problem. Our next illustrated example features a 12 volt battery with 2 ohms of internal resistance being asked to supply power to an electrical load modeled as a 60 ohm resistor. We're being asked to solve for the voltage drop across the load, the current through the load, the power dissipated by the load, the total power, and the efficiency where power delivered to the load is considered useful input and any power dissipated by the internal resistance is considered a loss. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The 12 volt battery sees a series combination of the internal resistance and the electrical load, or a total resistance of 62 ohms. Source current is supply voltage divided by total resistance. Substituting in our given values demonstrate the source provides 193.5 milliampers. Power supplied to this system is supply voltage times source current. Substituting our given values demonstrates the batteries providing 2.3 watts to this system. Current through elements in series is the same. Source current is equal to the current through the internal resistance, 
which is equal to current through the load, and they all equal 193.5 milliamperes. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the internal resistance experiences a 387.1 millivolt drop. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates the electrical load experiences the remaining 11.6 volt drop. An application of the power equation demonstrates the internal resistance dissipates 74.9 milliwatts. This would be considered a loss to this system. An application of the power equation demonstrates the load experiences 2.2 watts. This would be considered useful output. Efficiency is useful output over input, where useful output is considered power delivered to the load. 2.2 watts over 2.3 watts yields an efficiency of roughly 96.8%. You note at the present operating condition, the electrical load only experiences roughly 11.6 volts of the available 12 volts due to the small voltage drop across the internal resistance. This is what is known as the working voltage of a battery which is in contrast to its nominal or nameplate rating of 12 volts. Given any power consumed by the internal resistance is considered a loss, we might expect the battery to exhibit some small degree of temperature rise accounting for this inefficiency. Keep in mind these figures are snapshots of the system in its present configuration, and different operating conditions may yield different results. Speaking of different results, a next illustrated example problem is a variation of the previous one. As previously, this problem features a 12 volt battery with two ohms of internal resistance, only this time, the electrical load has been reduced to 20 ohms. Let's see how this reduction of load resistance affects the efficiency of this system. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should observe the following results. We could use a repeat of the analysis techniques in our previous example problem, however let's go about this in a different way. An application of the DC voltage divider rule demonstrates the internal resistance experiences a 1.1 volt drop. Application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates the electrical load experiences the remaining 10.9 volt drop. Power delivered by the source is equal to source voltage squared divided by total resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrates the source is delivering 6.5 watts to this system. Power consumed by the load is equal to the voltage across the load squared divided by load resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrates the load consumes 6 watts. This would be considered useful output of this system. Similarly, any power dissipated by the internal resistance is equal to voltage across the internal resistance squared divided by the internal resistance. Substituting our given values demonstrates the internal resistance dissipates 595 milliwatts of power. This would be considered a loss to this system. Efficiency is useful output over input. Substituting our given values demonstrate the efficiency of this system has dropped to 90.9%. You'll note at the present operating conditions, not only has the working voltage of the battery dropped, it's also less efficient. This is to imply that properties like efficiency and working voltage aren't static figures, but are rather dependent upon conditions. At the present operating conditions, the battery is delivering more power to the electrical load than our previous illustrated example. However, a larger portion of the input is being misdirected to losses than previously, thus the lower efficiency rating. Now let's move on to our next illustrated example problem. Our last illustrated example problem features a 48 volt source in series with three resistors and a switch. We're presented with two scenarios. Scenario one, switch is open. Scenario two, switch is closed. We're being asked to solve for the following voltages, VAB, VBC, VCD, and VD with respect to ground. We're also being asked to solve for the following voltages, VA with respect to ground, VB with respect to ground, VC with respect to ground, and VD with respect to ground. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. When the switch is open, no current travels through this system. As such, no voltage will be dropped across any individual element. This being said, all voltage will be dropped across the open. VCD equals 48 volts. It helps you to visualize this system while the switch is open. Think of anything connected to the positive terminal as charged up to 48 volts, and anything connected to the negative terminal is at zero volts. All differential occurs across CD, i.e. across the switch. With nodes A, B, and C at 48 volts, no differential across R1 nor R2 exists. VAB equals zero volts, as does VBC. Similarly, VD with respect to ground also equals zero volts. Scenario two, the switch closes. Everything changes when current starts flowing through the system. Individual elements will now experience a voltage drop. In this scenario, we're assuming the switch to be an ideal switch which presents no resistance to current flow. As such, the switch will experience no voltage drop. The voltage across the switch, VCD, will be equal to zero volts. An application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates V1 to be 13.2 volts. 
therefore VIB should be 13.2 volts. Another application of the voltage divider rule solving for V2 demonstrates V2 to also be 13.2 volts. Therefore, VBC is 13.2 volts. Finally, an algebraic manipulation of Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this circuit solving for unknown voltage V3 demonstrates V3 to be the remaining 21.5 volts. VD with respect to ground should be 21.5 volts. Given these node-to-node -node differentials, we should be able to solve for node-to-ground differentials using Kirchhoff's voltage law. VA with respect to ground is a 48 volt rise. VA with respect to ground is also a 21.5 volt rise plus a 0 volt rise plus a 13.2 volt rise plus another 13.2 volt rise for a total rise of 48 volts. VB with respect to ground is a 48 volt rise minus a 13.2 volt drop for a total differential of 34.8 volts with respect to ground. Coming at this from another perspective, VB is a 21.5 volt rise plus a 0 volt rise plus a 13.2 volt rise for a total rise of 34.8 volts with respect to ground. BC with respect to ground is a 48 volt rise minus a 13.2 volt drop minus another 13.2 volt drop for a total differential of 21.5 volts with respect to ground. Coming at this from a different direction, VC is a rise of 21.5 volts plus a rise of 0 volts for a total rise of 21.5 volts. Finally, VD with respect to ground is a 48 volt rise minus two 13.2 volt drops minus a 0 volt drop for a total rise of 21.5 volts with respect to ground. Coming at this from another direction, VD is 21.5 volts higher than ground. As I've said before, as long as you maintain consistency with respect to polarity, Kirchhoff's voltage law should yield workable results. Given both directions yielded identical answers, I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct, and we can bring this lecture to a close. In conclusion, this lecture examines several illustrated examples of series DC circuit analysis. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.